birthday, wherever you are. It's May 1st, 2021. And we have been talking about chapter seven and the title of chapter seven is working with others and sponsorship. Now the word sponsor does not appear in the big book in the first 164 pages. And the reason that the word sponsor does not appear in the first 164 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is because the word sponsor and the concept of a sponsor has changed since the book was printed. The word protege will appear. The word protege uh, is very appropriate, but the word sponsor at that time meant someone that vouched for you that said, yes, this is a person who's probably alcoholic. This is a person who gets in trouble with alcohol because the stigma of alcoholism was very, very different in the 1930s than it is today. You didn't have a bunch of movie stars and rock stars and God knows what kind of stars and famous people coming out and saying, I go to a 12 step program in those days. It was very, very different. So sponsor meant somebody that vouched for you because they didn't want people just coming in and kind of visiting the meetings. They didn't want that. They frowned on that. So we're uh, in chapter seven and we're, on, we're gonna be on page 93 and we're gonna start with your prospect may belong. But as is my want, as is my history, you guys have been around long enough to know that we're gonna review a few things from last week and the week before, before we kind of charge in to today's reading. Sponsorship is the purest and most vital form of service imaginable. And there are many, many people in a way that are afraid to sponsor, that are reluctant to sponsor. And I have a friend who lives in South New Jersey and I love the way she says it. So I'm gonna quote her. She says, I know you might be afraid to sponsor, but you better be afraid not to sponsor because without sponsoring, you're not working a 12 step program you're working an 11 step program. And as we all know, an 11 step program is not going to help me very, very much. Now I chose very carefully the picture behind me and the picture behind me is a very famous picture. Um, it's not very good actually. I'm gonna duck out of the way here. The guy that's supposed to look like Bill doesn't look anything like Bill. The guy that's supposed to look like Bob doesn't look like anything like Bob. And the guy that's supposed to look like Bill Dotson, who is the man on the bed, doesn't look anything like Bill Dotson. But what's very, very important to note about this, this picture is it illustrates for us in beautiful, beautiful fashion not only the vital importance of sponsorship, but it also illustrates the timeliness involved. Let's take a look at some things that are very important before we get to today's reading. Now, Dr. Bob got sober on June the 10th, 1935, right? Even though that date is incorrect, it's what we use. And how do I know that that date is incorrect? because a very easy perusal of the American Medical Association convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey says that the convention actually started on the 10th of June and ended on the 17th. So whether we use the right date or the date given, it doesn't really matter. Now, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob got busy right away. And when they went to see Bill Dotson, it was on June the 26th, 1935. And Bill Dotson had already had two days of sobriety. That's described in the chapter called A Vision for You. And A Vision for You says two days later, we, we revisited him, okay? So there's your timeline. You don't need two months of, of abstinence. You don't need two weeks of abstinence two days of abstinence will be enough to uncloud you from the allergy and the mental fog. And in, in alcoholics, very clearly when they're drunk, they're altered. And we don't think of ourselves very often as altered when we're in the sugar, but let me assure you that we are. And in order to appreciate and understand how altered I am, 
when a Reese's peanut butter cup is running my life, when I stop eating them, the clarity comes in and all of a sudden I realize, wow, I was really nutso. I was really mashuga when that Reese's peanut butter cup was running my life. Now, June the 26th, 1935, 16 days after Dr. Bob got sober. Dr. Bob got sober on June, the, if he got sober June the 10th, that's 16 days. So let's take a look at that timeline and let's understand why we work the steps quickly. And this is a question, if you listen on vision or you listen on any workshop where this is stated that you work the steps quickly, this is something that's going to come up. What are some of the most asked questions? What's the difference between recovered, recovering? Recovered is a person who's had a spiritual awakening. Recovering is someone who's working toward that. But both are fluid, both are liquid. If you stop doing the work and you've had a spiritual awakening, you'll tumble back into the disease. Then one of the next questions will be about what's your daily practice? And then the other question is how quickly should I work the steps? Well, the big book illustrates 16 days between Bill's original getting Bob soap, not Bill's, God's original, sorry, God's originally getting uh, Bob sober and he's already out. Was Bill Dotson the first person that they tried this with? No, he was not, but none of the other people that they went and visited in the hospital wanted their program, wanted what they're doing. Bill Dotson was the first person who wanted it. So this picture, which the original used to be at Stepping Stones in New York, you can see a copy of this at Stepping Stones in New York and millions of other places too. But that was originally given to Bill by the artist, and that has been taken to the AA archives. But the picture illustrates how vital it was. And if Bill Wilson were here right now, and he was sitting beside me, and I said, because of what happened on that day, Bill Dotson is as vital a founder of AA as Bill or Bob, he would agree with me he would absolutely agree with me. Why? Because in sponsoring Bill Dotson, what they proved beyond any reason, remember when you took geometry in high school, you had to prove that if angle A equal 45 degrees or angle B, whatever it was, I hate math, but this is the only way to really prove it. If angle A equal angle C, then all this other stuff is true. And then you, you do your proof. If Bill Dotson could get sober, and he was hospitalized eight times within six months in 1935, eight hospitalizations within six months, and he beat up a nurse. Could you just imagine how embarrassing that has to be to know you beat up a nurse? My God in heaven, no wonder the guy drank like he did. The shame and the guilt that he must have carried around with him, knowing what he did, he had to be un unbelievable. And all of us, every single one of us, be we a compulsive overeater that reaches obesity, or are we a person who's anorexic, a restrictor, a bulimic, exercise bulimia, regurgitation bulimia, uh, uh, laxative bulimia, doesn't matter what direction we come from, we carry around with us an incredible amount of guilt and shame and remorse. And we don't come in here on a winning streak. We come in here because things went horribly, horribly wrong in our lives. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, wow, I think, you know, my, my life is fantastic. Everything is groovy. Uh, I've got more money than I'll ever spend. Everything's going well. What can I, I think I'll go join OA. Nobody comes in here like that. Now, does that mean you have to wait 16 days to sponsor? No, but what I'm illustrating here is how quickly these guys got moving. And you see so many people today and they're just 
protracting out that step work. They're protracting out the working of the steps and it's taking longer and longer and longer. And this is part of where people are really struggling. People are really struggling. Now I sponsor very quick on delay Schnell and I still have people that go back into the disease too. Nothing is foolproof, but the quick method is the method illustrated in the book. And I find it works best not only for me, but for the people that I have sponsored through the years, that it gives them an opportunity to move through quickly. Very, very important that we use these illustrations. And a lot of people who are afraid to sponsor, they lose sight of the fact that the book and God do most of the work. Let's face a fact, either the person is ready or they're not. And if they're ready, and if they want to do this, Mickey Mouse could sponsor them and they'll recover. And if they don't want to do this, Bill Wilson could sponsor them. Dr. Bob could sponsor them. And it's not going to make one damn bit of difference. So this is not a program for people who need it. It's not a program for people who want it. It's a program for people who do it. And if the person is ready to take that action, they're going to recover. If they're not going to take that action, then they're not going to recover. And it's that simple. And yet it's that profound. Very, very important. I have to get out of the results business. I am not in the results business. Whether the person recovers or not is not up to me. Okay, let's go to page 93. And it says here, your prospect. So I'll give you a minute to get to that spot. It says your prospect may belong. Okay, your prospect may belong to a religious denomination. His religious education and training may be far superior to yours. In my case, probably. Uh, when I would go to Hebrew school as a kid, I seldom was paying attention. I had had all day at public school. Um, I wasn't really paying attention. The rabbis used to yell at me and scream at me. And, you know, I wasn't doing this and I wasn't doing that. I was thinking about Milky Way bars and Almond Joys. I wasn't thinking about the you know, the religion and all this other stuff. In that case, he's going to wonder how you can add anything to what he already knows. Let's stop right there. I am not here to instruct anyone in religion. I'm not here to instruct you in God 101. Here is what I'm here to do. I am here and I have... 22 plus years of abstinence from compulsive overeating. I have been in this program for 42 years. I have relapsed in this program. I relapsed in this program because I wasn't ready. I have relapsed in this program because I didn't give credibility to the fact that this is a progressive, permanent, fatal condition. And my Recovery was not progressive and the disease caught me from behind and tackled me very, very viciously. And I went into relapse. I have whatever knowledge I have of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're listening to the sound of my voice, be it on a podcast, be it live as we're doing it on Zoom here on May 1st, 2021, it's gonna make no difference. If you know how to read, you have all the knowledge of the big book that you need. Are you sitting here thinking, well, I don't know what page acceptance is on. And I don't know what page Dr. Bob says, I like blue cards, cars instead of red cars. I don't know what page that's on. And I'm not familiar with the page where Bill Wilson says, I like bubble gum and not other gum. Doesn't matter. All I need to do is know how to take you through the book. Whatever religion you are, whatever non-religion you are, it makes no difference to me. We are not here to discuss religion. If you are without religion, if you are a Protestant, a Catholic, a Muslim, a Jew, if you are a Buddhist or whatever it is you are, that's fantastic. Or if you're none of the above, 
that's fantastic too. We're here to discuss, and we're going to discuss this more tomorrow morning on Finding God, which is going to come out of the Los Angeles uh, inner group, at Los Angeles and New Jersey inner groups. But when we find God, what I'm here to talk about is how I found a connection to that higher power through the working of these steps. My Judaism is a separate and distinct entity that does not come into this. Yes, it's part of who I am, my Mishagas, my Narishkeit, my whatever. Yes, that's definitely part of it. No question about that that's a part of who I am. But I'm not here to impart that on you. I'm here to go through the book and together we will come to believe that there is a power greater than ourselves which can restore us to sanity. It doesn't say came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to abstinence. It doesn't say came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sobriety. It says came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And sanity is much more high ceilinged and open ended than either sobriety or abstinence. And it says came to believe came to believe suggests that this is a process, a journey rather than an event. If you want me to point to an event where I believed in God as opposed to before, I don't have that event to point to. What I have is a series of epiphanies, too small to notice, but together registered in my soul and in my brain as being that connection to that power greater than myself. I hope I'm making sense because sometimes in my own mind, I'm not. Hold on one second. <sighs> my fakakta allergies are getting better because as it's getting a little hotter, some of the fakakta dreck that's in the air is that would, would make me look like I'm crying. I was, I was doing my walk the other day. I walked three miles six days a week in the morning and a woman walked past me just as the sun was coming up and she says, oh, mister, are you crying? And I, no, no, I'm not crying. I just have allergies like you wouldn't believe. So she says, oh, I thought you were crying. No, I'm not crying. I'm okay. I'm really okay. So anyway, came to believe. So whether you're very religious, not religious, it doesn't matter. We're not here to talk about. We're not here to analyze religious practices. Those are yours. They're your business and they're up to you, whatever it is you want to do. Okay, let's continue, but I want to make that very clear. So what did we talk about here? There's two things that are important to remember. You don't need a PhD from Dartmouth to sponsor somebody. You don't need a PhD in the big book. All you need to do is take them through the way you were taken through. And if you can read through there, the chapters of the book will flip you through the steps. The doctor's opinion through chapter three is step one. Step two, we agnostics. Chapter five, steps three and four. Chapter six, steps five through 11. Chapter seven is step 12. The book will do the work for you. Just share with them your truth. Share with them your experience, strength, and hope. And you are as fine a sponsor as there is. Let's continue. But he will be curious to learn why his own convictions have not worked and why yours seem to work so well. I have sponsored ministers. I have sponsored rabbis. I have sponsored, I've never sponsored a nun, but I've sponsored priests twice. And it is baffling to them often. And there's been a few deacons and lay ministers that have come through during the years. It is very baffling to most of them that their work in religion is insufficient to bring about a spiritual awakening 
as the result of, of the steps, but they weren't doing the steps. They were helping, they were doing this and they were doing that, but they weren't working the steps. This is not about the practice of religion. It's about working the steps. Okay, let's continue. To be vital, faith must be accompanied by self-sacrifice and unselfish constructive action. Now, what is the trap that a lot of us fall into, boys and girls? We fall into the trap that if I sponsor you, I'm looking for a particular result. I want you to be recovered. I want you to tell everybody how wonderful I am. I want you to tell everybody what a great sponsor I am. And it doesn't work that way. It says, to be vital, faith must be accompanied by self-sacrifice. Some of this stuff is stuff I rather wouldn't, I would rather not do. I'm absolutely positive that when I did it, I benefited tremendously. I'm, I know that for a fact, but there were times when I was watching a ball game or I was whatever I was doing or sitting around whatever, and somebody called and I really didn't want to take that phone call. And you know what I did? And you know what? It helped me because whether I said it or the other person said it, it was exactly what I needed to hear at the time and unselfish constructive action. And when it says unselfish constructive action, that also means to me that I am divorced from results. Most of the people that I sponsored are still in the food, but I'm not. Remember that famous story of Bill Wilson coming home in March of 1934 just before he left for Akron in April of 34, he meets Dr. Bob Mother's Day, 1934, 1935, excuse me, 1935, 1935. And Bill is, Bill's down, he's despondent. And he says to Lois, you know, Lois, I got this message from God in my head that says I'm supposed to sober up drunks. And it's not working. I, I keep trying to sober these people up and nothing's happening. Nothing is going on. And she turned to him and she could have said to him, yeah, you're right, Bill, you're wasting your time. This doesn't work. But she was too smart for that or she was inspired by God to say something that changed the course of the world. What did she say? She said, but you're staying sober. And Bill Wilson said, yeah, you're right, I'm staying sober. And it was the very first time in Bill Wilson's entire adult life that he was not only sober, but he was happy to be sober. Because you see, before that, when he was sober, he was miserable, just miserable. When I'm on a diet, Oh my God, I am a miserable, miserable human being. But when I'm in recovery and I'm not eating because I don't want to be eating, my brain just doesn't see the need to eat Oreo cookies, I'm a happy man. Now, does that mean everything in my life goes exactly the way I want it to go? You bet it does not. But what it means is I know that I'm being taken care of. I know that I'm God's child and I know that I'm, oh, I'm going to be okay. I am okay and I'm going to be okay because I've been assured many times in the book that these promises are coming true and they will continue to do so. Let's continue. Let him see that you are not there to instruct him in religion. Very important. Stay out of arguments or discussions about their religion. Admit that he probably knows more about it than you do, but call to his attention the fact that however deep his faith and knowledge, he could not have applied it or he would not drink. Perhaps your story will help him see where he has failed to practice these very precepts he knows so well. We represent no particular faith or denomination. We are dealing only with general principles common to most denominations. Very, very important to remember. We're not here to discuss or debate religion. Even if the person is the same religion, you may have different levels of adherence to the principles of that religion. So my 
strong suggestion, my strong suggestion is the less said about it, the better. The less said about it, the better. Whatever their religion is, their business. Page 94, outline the program of action. In other words, you can talk about the steps. Explaining how you made a self-appraisal, step four. How you straighten out your past, eight and nine. And why you are now endeavoring to be helpful to him, 12. You can explain it that it is in giving that I receive. And that it is in giving that I <clears throat> recover. This is vital. I do not get this program by absorbing spiritual information. I will get this program by transmitting spiritual information. Let's take a look at the picture behind me, the man on the bed, very famous picture. And let's pretend for just a minute that the man on the bed wasn't Bill Dotson, but the man on the bed was Joe Relapse and that Joe had no intention of staying out of the food. The two guys over here that are supposed to be Bill and Bob, as long as they stayed sober, that was the object of the exercise. You want the person to recover? I want everybody I sponsor to recover? I, tr I do, I truly do. If I had a button to push, uh, relapse or, or recovery, I push that recovery button every time. I can't imagine what would, what would motivate me not to. But at the end of the day, if I haven't eaten food that I'm ashamed of, if I haven't done anything to destroy myself, if I haven't brought guilt and shame and remorse into my soul, to soil my soul, I've had a good day. I've had a really good day. And in the final analysis, it's between me and God. And what I wanna make sure of is that my relationship with God is right. And I know that if my relationship with God is right, then great events will come to pass for me and countless others. That is the great fact for us, very, very important. I've sponsored many people. Most of them are in the food. Too bad. Too bad. Maybe they'll come back. I hope so. I hope so. I pray so. It is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery. Because you see a lot of people that are just particularly newcomers that have never been around 12-step programs before, they may wonder what on earth your motivation is for doing this. Are you going to ask them for money? Are you going to ask them for favors? Are you going to ask them for whatever? I don't know. Are you going to ask them to borrow their lawnmower or whatever it is? I don't know. I am doing it and I explain this to people for my own recovery. Now, you don't have to do this, but this is something I do. And this is something that I do every time I talk to a person that I sponsor. I say to that person at the end of the conversation, thank you for helping God keep me out of the food for one more day. Thank you for helping God keep me out of the food for one more day. Because that is the most honest thing I can say to that person. Thank you. Because if nobody called me for sponsorship, I'd be in trouble. I'd be in trouble. <sighs> okay, let's continue. Making it plain he is under no obligation to you that you hope only that he will try to help other alcoholics. What do I say to people all the time? Pass it on when he escapes his own difficulties. Suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. Make it clear that he is not under pressure, that he needn't see you again if he doesn't want to. You should not be offended if he wants to call it off, for he has helped you more than you have helped him. 
If your talk has been sane, quiet, and full of human understanding, you have perhaps made a friend. Maybe you have disturbed him about the question of alcoholism. This is all to the good. The more hopeless he feels, the better. He will be more likely to follow your suggestions. When they have ideas on how they're going to do this themselves, get out of their way. Get out of their way. Don't stand between anybody and ice cream. Don't stand between anybody and their next food fix because you're not going to be able to control them and you shouldn't be able to control them. That's fine. But you are not going to get in the way of somebody and their food fix. It's just not going to happen. Get out of their way. Your candidate may give reasons why he need not follow all the program. He may rebel at the thought of a drastic house cleaning, which requires discussion with other people. Do not contradict such views. Tell him you once felt as he does, but you doubt whether you would have made much progress had you not taken action. On your first visit, tell him about the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Notice that that's in capital letters. And the reason that it's in capital letters is because for many, the fellowship is their higher power. G-O-D, group of drunks. A lot of people have trouble with step two. They have trouble with a concept of God. Maybe when it says in the book about the, he's the father of light that presides over us all, or he's, he is the father, we are his children. Maybe that conjures up some negative emotions in that person. Maybe it conjures up some images of a father that wasn't there or that was abusive or that was whatever. I don't know. Maybe their father physically hit them or, or whatever or molested or something. Everybody comes from, you know, a little bit of a different path. But what for a lot of people, how they get in touch with God at first is they use the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and they call it God, a group, of drunks. My first higher power was Lake Michigan. I'd look on Lakeshore Drive as I was cruising downtown and I'd look out at the at the morning sun and there was Lake Michigan and sometimes she was violent and sometimes she was just as peaceful as peaceful can be. And if you've never seen Lake Michigan, it's you would not know the difference between it and an ocean. You can't say see across it. You can't, you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's 196 miles long and 98 miles wide. So you can't see across it. You can't, it's huge. And it didn't seem to care that the Cubs lost yesterday. It didn't seem to care that the economy might be up or down or, or this girl would love me or that girl wouldn't love me. It didn't seem to care no matter what was going on. It just remained constant. So I used it as my first higher power. Now it's not my higher power today, but it was my first one, group of drunks. If he shows interest, lend him your copy of this book. Let him read it. Unless you're, I'm at the top of 95. Notice we're going a little faster this week than we did last week because those, that, those two paragraphs that we covered last week just really don't allow uh, speed. They really need to be taken apart. Unless your friend wants to talk further about himself, do not wear out your welcome. In other words, what I've seen are people, and I've seen this in sales too, they want to browbeat the person into submission. They want to keep talking and talking and talking and talking and hopes that they can sort of browbeat the person into saying, yes, I'm a compulsive overeater. Yes, I want you to sponsor me and I'll do whatever you say. That has to be more organic. It's like catching a bird. It's like catching a bird. Go to your local park with some seeds or crusts of bread or something. Don't eat them, but go with them and see how you can catch a pigeon, okay? Run after one and see if you can catch it or, or sit there and bring the seed in your hand, bring it down to ground level and don't move a muscle. And what will eventually happen? The birds will come over to you. And I lived in Eugene, Oregon for nine years. And instead of just pigeons in their park, they have ducks and they have geese and they have more, more beautiful birds than pigeons. 
And my daughter, when she was born, we lived there. And I also had, I've had German shepherds for a very long time, very long time. And the German shepherds would try to get to one of the birds and he couldn't catch them. He couldn't, he couldn't catch them. The birds were too quick and they can do one thing he couldn't do. He, they could fly. And my daughter wanted to pet one of the birds. So she'd run after them. I could still, I see her now. She's so, she looked just like my father, but she didn't smoke and she speaks English, but she looked just like my dad and she'd run after the birds and she couldn't catch them. And I'd say to her, stand there with the bread and they will come to you. And they did. And she would smile and she would laugh. And she thought that was the cutest thing in the world that the birds came over to her. And if you stand there with the bread, stand there with the book, stand there with your recovery that is evident for all to see that you show physical recovery, that you show emotional recovery, that you are demonstrating what these steps, what these principles can do for a human being, you won't have to shout very loudly. You won't have to browbeat anyone. They will come to you. Make yourself known that you're available by going either in your meetings. Now it's a little different because, you know, I'm used to in, in person meetings, you know, because this Zoom thing is very new. This is very, very new. But I'm used to the live in person meetings. But or let's, let's discount that for a while because who knows when we're going to be getting back. I woke up this morning with just an urge to say, man, I hope the OA birthday in January happens in person because man, I want to come to LA and see everybody. I've just been so, I'm missing everybody so, so, so much. So I hope that somehow God will allow that to happen. But anyway, that aside, bring your recovery. Don't chase the birds. Let the birds know you're there. Let the birds know you're available and stand there with your gift to them and they will beat a path to your door because they want to feel like you feel. They want to have what you have. They may not do, they may not want to do what you did and those are the questions that remain to be seen and answered. But stand there. Don't chase them like that. You don't have to be so active. Let them know you're available. Let them know what's going on. Here I am. God will do the rest. I promise you, God will do the rest. Okay, give him a chance to think it over. If you do stay, let him steer the conversation in any direction that he likes. And I've had people um, over the years, they do not want to talk about this because they don't want to do it, but they don't know how to get away from me. I let them get away from me. I am not here to sell you on it. I sell for a living. I'm not here to sell you on this. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I've told this story before. I'm going to tell the story again. I just feel very given by God to tell this story. It's not really that late, is it? Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. Anyway, okay, sorry. Um, I was in, um, I did a big book study in a place called Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Beautiful, beautiful town, beautiful area. It's Amish country there. And it's just, it's, it's, it's very weird. You're driving down the street and then right next to you at a stoplight is a horse and a buggy. You know, the black buggies and the black horses and the black uh, tack and that that go on the horse. It's really, the, to hear the clip clop of, of the horses on the street is, is amazing. But before you get to Lancaster, you've got to go to Philadelphia. And then a gentleman picked me up in Philadelphia and drove me to Lancaster. And he says to me, you've got to talk to so-and-so. I forgot the person's name. I, I wish to, heck, I could remember his name, but it's not important to the story. I wish I could remember it so I can convince myself I wasn't going uh, senile. But anyway, that aside, 
He says, you got to talk to this guy. Jerry was his name. Jerry. He's dead now. Name was Jerry. Okay. Now I feel better. I know you don't, but I do. Okay. Now, I says, does Jerry want to see us? And he says, I don't care what he wants. He's 500 pounds and he needs to see you. I says, well, if he doesn't want to see us, let's not go there and bother him. He says, no, no, we're going. I've been planning this and that's why I volunteered to pick you up. I thought, oh man, we're going to a hospital to see a guy that doesn't want to see us. Oh man. Well, I, what could I do? I mean, I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania for crying out loud. I'm 3000 miles away from where my car was at Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix. What am I supposed to do? So we get to the hospital and this guy's five, 600 pounds, if he's an ounce. I mean, he is humongous and he's got all the characteristics that I had. And he's got the swollen ankles and, and his feet are being elevated and he's all kinds of stuff. And we came into the room and the look on this guy's face was, oh God, I don't want to see these people. And he made himself soil the bed. He forced himself to soil the bed, knowing that the nurse would have to come in and that she would take us out of the room while she cleaned up the mess. And I said to the guy, I'm waiting downstairs or we're leaving. And he mercifully left. What's the moral of the story? Because this guy, Jerry, was dead within a couple of months after that, after that visit. This is not a program for people who need it. Don't triage them. You know what I mean by when I say don't triage them? Don't run after them because they're morbidly obese or dangerously thin. Stand there with your, with your program. Make yourself available by telling the people in your meeting, I'm available, here's my phone number, here's this. You're not going to be in the room with them because we're not in person-to-person -person meetings until January when we all get to Los Angeles, wink, wink. So the bottom line is, is that make it known, and this is not a program for people who need it. It's not a program for people who want it. It's a program for people who do it. Don't triage them, guys. Let's continue. Sometimes a new man is anxious to proceed at once, and you may be tempted to let him do so. This is sometimes a mistake. Relax. Take it at your pace. I do a chapter a day with them. Take it easy. The fastest way to blow a sale. I've been in sales for as long as I've been in these rooms. The fastest way to blow any type of sale is to be over anxious. I'll give you the oldest adage in sales, dating, and gambling. Sales, dating, and gambling. This is the oldest adage in these fields, and it applies to sponsorship. Desperate money never wins. Desperate money means, are you desperate for this person to recover? Are you pushing them too much? Are you letting them control you? You have to be the adult in the room. You are the sponsor. You have to be the adult in the room. I hear this all the time. Well, I can't sponsor him that way because he's this. And I can't sponsor her that way because she's that. Hogwash. This is the program. They're either going to do it or they're not. Okay. If he has trouble later, he is likely to say you rushed him. You will be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit any passion for crusade or reform. Desperate money never wins. Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. Show him how they worked with you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. And this reminds me of a story that happened 
in early uh, in in March of 1935, when Bill Wilson had that conversation with uh, his wife Lois Wilson, and Lois Wilson said to when, when Bill was complaining that nobody was getting sober, and 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 he complained to Lois, and Lois said, "But you're staying sober." What did Lois say after that when they were on their way? to the Oxford group meeting that night. She says, Bill, why don't you go see Dr. Why don't you go see Dr. Silkworth before you leave for Ohio? And he did. And he came into Dr. Silkworth's office and Dr. Silkworth said, I've heard about some of these shenanigans you're pulling out there, Bill, in the bars and you're dragging these guys off the bar stools and you're telling them about God and you're telling them about all these things and they don't want to get sober. You're just pulling them off the bar. He said to Bill Wilson, why don't you tell them what I told you? Tell them of the hopeless condition of mind and body. Tell them what I told you about the physical allergy. Tell them what I told you about the twist of the mind, the irresistible urge to drink against your will in search of an effect. And that effect is so elusive that we cannot differentiate between the true and the false. And we will chase that effect to the gates of insanity or death in search of relief from the pain of not eating. Tell them that. And he left for Ohio. And the very first person that he tried this new method on just happened to be Dr. Robert Holbrook Smith. Dr. Robert Holbrook Smith, Dr. Bob. And this was the first person that he tried this new method on and the world was changed forever because of it. Let's continue. If he's not interested in your solution, if he expects you to act only as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his street, these are called the three ifs, by the way. The three ifs are on page 95, if, if, and if. We're, we're, I'll try to get through all three ifs today. If not, I'll get through them next week for sure. But this is the first if. If he is not interested in your solution, if he expects you to act only as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his sprees, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may do after he gets hurt some more. Now, what is that telling you, boys and girls? You may have to get out of the way of disaster. Prevent no catastrophe, cause no catastrophe. If they are bound and determined to go back into the disease and they have to suffer more pain, you trying to stand in the way of that pain is not going to be effective. That's the first if. The second if, if he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. After doing that, he must decide for himself whether he wants to go on. He has to decide for himself. You can't push him and prod him. They have to decide themselves. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he is to find God, the desire must come from within. That's the second of the ifs. The first if is, if he doesn't want to do what you want him to do, you, may, you need to leave him alone. There are, the three ifs are on page 95. He may have to suffer some more pain. The second if is uh, he has to decide for himself. And the third if is if he thinks he can do the job in some other way or prefers some other spiritual approach, encourage him to follow his own conscience. We have no monopoly on God. We merely have an approach that worked with us, but point out that we alcoholics have much in common and that you would like in any case to be friendly let it go at that. So the first if doesn't want to do this, was him gain, leave him alone. Second if, if he is sincerely interested and he wants to see you, but he, he's got to decide for himself. And the third if is he wants this, but he's got some other way of doing it. 
leave them alone. We do not have a monopoly on God. Those are the three ifs. Very, very important. Okay. 96. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Now, I'm going to go through this paragraph in the six or seven minutes we have left, but I'm going to start back at this paragraph next week. And the reason I'm going to start back at this paragraph next week is it is so vital to our understanding. It is so vital for our success as a fellowship that without the concept here, we are in trouble. And I hear this all the time. I'm sponsoring Mo, Larry, and Curly. And Curly, he's relapsing all the time. And it's been years and blah, blah, blah. Leave him alone. Let's go to the paragraph. And we're going to go back to this paragraph next week. You can bet your bippy on it. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. If you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover by himself. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny <clears throat> some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. One of our fellowship failed entirely with his first half dozen prospects. He's talking about himself. He's talking about Bill. He often says that if he had continued to work on them, he might have deprived many others who have since recovered of their chance. You have somebody, they really don't want to do this, leave them alone. You are not probably going to convince them that they should do it. You can only convince them of how you did it. You cannot make that demand on them that they recover when they don't want to. It is not possible that that is going to work. It's just not possible. So let's get out of the results business. And if a person is not recovering and they've been hearing your voice, it doesn't mean that you don't like them. It doesn't mean that you don't care about them. It doesn't mean anything of the kind. What it means is they need to hear a different voice. You're not helping them. You're hurting them if they're not recovering. <sighs> okay, now, what I would like to do now, there's 133 of us here. Let me write down where we're leaving off. And what I would like to do now, we're a couple minutes early, but I want you all to indulge me in something. And what I would like is your input and carol my friend in los angeles has a way of voting the last time you guys were texting me and that was great but this is even more efficient because not only will we have instant results but it's a very very effective way of doing this and she's going to post on your zoom do you want me to continue after chapter seven into chapter eight nine ten and eleven or do you want me after chapter seven, as you did last time, to go back to the doctor's opinion and start again? So I'm going to let Maria or Carol or someone put that up there and you guys vote whether you want me to continue or you want me to start over again. Okay, Harlan, thanks very much. And thanks for unpacking step 12 for us. Um, Harlan, and we have done the poll and we are, we have two questions. So we're going to do two polls. And the first poll is, the first question is, do you want Harlan to continue reading on in the big book? Two wives, the family afterwards, two employers, a vision for you. The poll is complete. I'm going to share the results with you. We 78% who say yes and 22% who stay, say no. So okay. we are now, we're now going to do the second poll. Okay. So just bear with us while we do the second poll. The question is, do you want Harlan to return to the doctor's opinion after cha chapter seven, working with others? We're going to launch that poll. It's the same thing though. Yeah, well, it is the same thing really, yeah. Basically. Well, it's... Okay. I'm not voting, by the way, whatever you guys decide that. Good with, I'm good with either way. Okay. 
Okay, we have 57% that would say yes to that, 42% that say no. So at the moment, the other poll um, precedes this question. So at the moment, it is that we will continue on reading through to, okay? okay? That's okay. what Great. Now we should do one more, and that is, do we want Susan G to appear before the California state legislature to get us dispensation from any type of corona uh, restrictions so that we can have the birthday live? Do you want her to appear before the legislature in Sacramento? Yes, we do. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Good. I'll, I will let her know. I don't know if she's on here or not, but the bottom line is, okay. All right. So let's, let's roll it. I'm sorry. I, I should, I'm a little mashuga today. I'm telling you, uh, just excuse my narish kite today. Okay. Ah, oh, there is mirror. Oh my God. Okay. Um, just one question, Harlan. Do you want the poll to run again next week? Are you happy? Yeah, let's do them again next week to see where everybody's at. We'll do them twice. And then the week after, we're going to be in Athens, Greece, so we won't be together. Okay. And um, so next week, yeah, let's do them again and let's see what we come up with. It'll probably be the same thing, though. Okay. It'll probably be the same thing. Oh, my God. Oh, so it's getting better, though. Karen K in Syracuse, New York for Q&A. Hi, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hello. Oh. We have, um, you can use the um, reactions. You can raise your hand that way. We have, um, we only have one hand up, so feel free to uh, raise your hand. And if you've asked a question last week, if you could please hold back and let others ask their question for this week. So we have Marie, Kat, and Tina. Marie, your, your a question, please. Hi, Harlan, I have two questions. I just completed step four, and I'm wondering if you would be available to help me with my step five to accept my inventory. Um, wouldn't you be better off doing that, or wouldn't you rather do that with your sponsor? Uh, from my understanding, I'm supposed to give my inventory to someone else versus my sponsor. There's, there's no, there's no instruction that you, that it's someone else. You could do it with your sponsor or you could do it with somebody else. That's perfectly okay. Um, why don't you call me offline and we won't do this here in this forum. Why don't you call me if you're in another country, use WhatsApp because I, otherwise I can't return your call if I don't catch it. Why don't you call me separately and we'll discuss it. What's your number, please? Uh, well, I'll give it to you when the recording is over. It's very easy to get, but when the recording is over, I will, I will give it to you. Okay. 